my talk, as you see, is staying in the workforce with fibromyalgia. Um, my supervisor was Ellen McKechn, at uh, who was here at Institute for Work and Health for most of the time that I was working with her. And I'm going to give you my conclusions to start and then work backwards and tell you how I got here. So how did women with fibromyalgia stay at work? Uh, two main reasons that I found were, or two main strategies were, that uh, they managed their workplace identities through um, first, impromptu everyday disclosure dances, which I'll explain a little later. And second, through portrayals of the women as normal, valuable employees who had not given in to their illness. And these were portrayals not just by the women themselves, but by their family members and their workmates, who I also interviewed. So these two forms of identity management help prevent, uh, prevent women's entry into the stigma process, and which I'll explain shortly. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the background to the research, I'll give you the research question, uh, introduce you to qualitative research for people who um, don't do it. Um, conceptual framework is an important part of qualitative research. I'll talk about my methodology, the findings, implications of the findings, and the next steps where I'm going now with the with, uh, my thinking. So as background, 520,000 Canadians have fibromyalgia, a uh, chronic illness. 82% uh, of those people are women, so it's quite a female-dominated illness. Um, in an early study I did in the doctorate, I found that fibromyalgia patient information gives almost no advice about employment. It's as if employment doesn't exist. But uh, when I looked at the Canadian Community Health Survey data, from Stats Canada, I found that 44% of Canadians with fibromyalgia are, in fact, in the labor force, working or looking for work. So I wondered, well, how are they doing that, given that they're not getting much help from information sources? So my research question was, given the challenges of remaining employed, how do women with fibromyalgia stay at work? I'll give you a little introduction to qualitative research. How many people here are doing qualitative research? Oh, great, great. Okay, so don't need too much of an introduction. Um, I want to point out that the point of qualitative research, as we understand it, or uh, the people that I work with, is to uh, look at the how and the why of phenomena, not so much the who, what, where, and uh, the who, what, when, and where, uh, but the how and the why. And this is helped by doing in-depth research with uh, small numbers of people, which you can't do if you're doing large samples. Uh, our research is framed by social theory and social concepts. And we consider knowledge to be partial and very contingent on the context. So the research context is very important, uh, it, whether it's an interview, participant observation, other forms of collecting data, uh, so that the research isn't replicable because you can't rep reproduce the, contract, the context of the research. And in, in addition, that there's, there's no one truth to be found in the data. We're not looking for a single truth. Uh, we're interpreting the data. In fact, the main analytical tool in qualitative research is the researcher, him or herself, who brings their worldview and values to the research. And we do, we reflect on this, we, we think through how that impacts the research that we're doing um, and how it changes us as researchers. So here's my conceptual framework. I called it a conceptual framework because I'm actually, I actually used three concepts to understand what was going on in the data. The first is stigma as a social process, and that's represented by the, graph, the graphic on the right side of the screen. Uh, in the stigma as a social process, you may have read about stigma as, as a mark. This is the, the idea from Goffman's work in 1963 that's still quite predominant. This idea of stigma as a social process was developed by Link and, Fal Link and Phelan in 2001. And they described um, stigma as, as something that happens over time through inter social interaction. First, um, a difference is labeled. Someone is labeled with a difference. And things are fine if that label uh, doesn't have any negative stereotypes, stereotypes attached to it. But if it does, then there's an opportunity for other people to separate the person who's different into an us and them situation. So the person with the difference becomes a them, an outsider. They lose status in, in the social sphere, and they're very vulnerable to discrimination. 
So this framework helps me understand the data, and I'll show you uh, what the participants were doing in relation to the stigma as a social process. The second conce um, concept in the framework is discourses. Discourses are scaffolds of assumptions that enable certain ways of thinking and inhibit others. They're very dominant ideas in society that people adopt, um, perhaps unknowingly, and use um, to think about phenomena in the world and think about the ways they interact with other people. The third concept is workplace identity management. And this is an idea from the business literature that uh, people, employees, construct workplace identities using available discourses. Uh, ideas, dominant ideas that are important in their workplaces, in their professions, in their fields, and so on. The methodology that I used was critical discourse analysis. Uh, in this methodology, researchers analyzed discourses in text. In the case of my research, it was participant interviews. It might be speeches. It might be uh, newspaper articles. could be a variety of things. Um, and we see in critical discourse analysis that interviews are interactions or performances um, by the person being interviewed, by the researcher, rather than uh, the researcher pulling ideas out of somebody's head. Um, critical discourse analysis also deals with power. That's the critical in critical discourse refers to looking at power and power relations in, in the data. And it aims to understand participants' use of language and how participants construct identities out of discourses, as described in the concept of workplace identity management. So here's how I collected my data. Um, in the, I'm just going to grab this little thing. The, the, the center of each uh, group of participants was a woman with fibromyalgia who was employed. Um, I asked each woman that I recruited if she was willing to recommend somebody at work, a supervisor or a colleague to be interviewed, as well as a family member. And this was because I wanted to look at not just the work environment, which of course is very important to staying in the workforce, but the, felt the home environment for women because they do so much work still uh, in the home that's unpaid. It was important, I felt, to understand what was going on in, in their families. Uh, because the women often recommended co-workers instead of supervisors, I wanted to know more about the supervisor's point of view, so I also interviewed three extra managers who didn't know the women as well as a union staff member because unions and seniority uh, kept coming up in the data, so I wanted to learn more. The data analysis strategies I used were um, First, managing the data through coding, and then when I had the coding done, I did code summaries of particular codes that seemed to be most helpful for understanding the data and answering the research question. These were a way of analyzing the data across the groups, the tri what I called triads and dyads that I just showed you in the previous slide. I also wrote narrative summaries, and this was a way of analyzing the, the data within the triads and dyads. Um, and looking at the interactions and the diff particularly the differing perspectives that the workmates and the uh, family members and the women themselves brought to the idea of staying at work with chronic illness. Yeah? How did you find the people? Were you in a single workplace? No. Uh, I put out a call to, to uh, numerous contacts that I had. The most successful one was the Women's Health Listserv, which runs through Ontario, and it actually got me people across the country. But because I asked women to uh, refer the, the, the notice to others, and I ended up getting a large pool and narrowed it down basically by what were the women in the greater Toronto area because I wanted to interview them in person, and were they willing to recommend a family member and a workplace party, and not all of them were. Does that answer that question? Okay. Um, so the third method that I used, uh, the third data analysis strategy I used was taking field notes. After each interview, I um, did a, a summary of the interview, so I had it fresh in my mind, and I did notes about the research context before, during, and after the interview. And I also used uh, analytical memos as I went along during the analysis to record ideas I was noticing about relationships in the data and to make, when I made decisions about analysis, I recorded those. I also used relational mapping. 
which was a strategy to try and find connections between concepts that we're developing and, and code dimensions that was very helpful. So the participants, I had 26 participants in total. There were nine employed women with fibromyalgia, seven of their family members, six workmates, co-workers or supervisors, and four additional managers and union staff. So I'm going to start with the findings now. Participants often reported stereotypes. Uh, a major one was fibromyalgia is not real. Another was that fibromyalgia with Women with fibromyalgia are lazy and they're malingering. They're faking their illness to um, get something. And the third was that employees with chronic illnesses are less productive than healthy employees. So as you see, that's the beginning of, that's the second stage in the stigma process where it starts getting risky. So because of these stereotypes that are floating around that, that all the participants talked about, uh, disclosing your fibromyalgia at work was seen as risky in many cases. And then there was the employment context. Of course, we're all familiar with precarious work and the idea that productivity is now the driving importance of employer, that employers place on employees rather than being loyal to employees and, and employees being loyal to employers. Um, but even within stable jobs and uh, unionized um, permanent jobs, I found in the data that there were budget cuts and downsizing. So there was competition going on to keep jobs, as well as uh, one of my participants was quite young, and she talked about a lot of competition to get into the labor, for, to get her first job. She was competing with healthy people, and this was uh, a great concern to her. So this was a coworker of one of the women with fibromyalgia talking about a situation where she had been a friend of hers in her union had been at a meeting with managers and overheard this conversation. Managerial staff were talking about all the cost factors and all the workload increases and cutbacks. This supervisor turned around and said, well, I know how to control my workers and get them to get their work done. You just put enough pressure on them and they all scatter like cockroaches. So therefore, people are feeling unsupported by each other. All of a sudden, you get worried about yourself in the workplace. And so then you're becoming super achievers in the workplace, attempting to make yourself outshine others. And this was coworker had a chronic illness herself, not fibromyalgia, but another one. And so she was feeling this pressure to perform uh, against healthy people. So the first concept that I came up with that came out of the data uh, of the participants that they talked not so much about making declarations about their need for accommodations to supervisors or HR departments, but having to do dances about disclosure. And by dances, I mean movements back and forth between uh, the, the woman with fibromyalgia, somebody else in the workplace, often a colleague, uh, to um, deal with the disclosure risk, to try and explain something without doing something risky to the competitiveness of the employee. And these were within everyday workplace conversations. Um, there were three interacting dimensions that I uh, interpreted from the data. Uh, one was selectively divulging illness. The second one was revealing impairments selectively and partially. And the third was exposing oneself to scrutiny. So I'm not going to explain what those are. Selectively divulging illness was the idea that women talked about their fibromyalgia only to some people, only to people they trust. And they, uh, as some women, as a couple of women said, I don't want to use fibromyalgia as, as an excuse. And this phrase could be interpreted in several ways. It could be that they didn't want to expose themselves as having fibromyalgia because this is considered an illegitimate disease, could give, um, rise to accusations of malingering and so on. But it also could be that they didn't want to use any illness as an excuse. That, um, so they were very careful about who they told. Um, they often told only people in empathetic relationships. This was something that many of the women had at work. Uh, they'd found someone that they could confide in. And it was often somebody who had a chronic illness themselves or who was very close to someone who did. So they understood the risks of disclosure at work uh, if you have any kind of chronic illness. And they, were, they could be trusted to be um, keep the information confidential and not push the employee into the stigma process through gossip. Um, so sometimes women used this explanation uh, when it was safe to preempt coworker resentment of uh, accommodations perhaps for something that was 
uh, an individual impairment like pain or fatigue, which are quite common in fibromyalgia. Uh, sometimes they use it to explain their inability to do a task. Uh, sometimes they wanted to help other people in, in a safe relationship by saying, I have that too, or I have something similar, just to help the other person feel uh, comfortable or being able to talk about their own situation. And sometimes they did it because they felt the need to be honest. There's this idea out there that disclosure is the honest thing to do. Uh, and some people, uh, some of the women took that up, and, and that's why they told others about their illness. Then there was revealing impairments partially and selectively. This was the idea that women gave more details about their impairments to some people than others. For example, within empathetic relationships that seemed quite important to them. Uh, in other cases, they used common name, commonplace names for their symptoms, for their impairments, like I've got a bad back or I have bad knees. And women actually got informal accommodations by using these phrases. They didn't have to tell people, their colleagues or their employers, that they have fibromyalgia and that they need an accommodation that's formal. They, they were able to get for informal accommodations through talking about a bad back, which is a very common problem with a lot of people. It doesn't, it doesn't have, um, it's very legitimate, much more legitimate than fibromyalgia would be. The third element of disclosure dances, and I should mention that women were using these um, dimensions of disclosure dances interchangeably. They didn't just pick one. And they were things, they were, these were impromptu dances. They weren't thought out in advance weighing the pros and cons in the way that, would, that you would do if you were declaring uh, a need for an accommodation. They were things that came up on the spur of the moment and women had to invent things to say. Um, so exposing oneself to scrutiny was the idea that uh, a couple of the women used, in particular one, to um, talk about identify that they had fibromyalgia and that it made them ill in these ways. They got um, pain, they, they, they got very tired, they had to take time off, whatever, however the fibromyalgia affected the women. Um, they did this to convince others that their illness is legitimate, that they're not making up the pain and fatigue. This is because of a legitimate illness, even though fibromyalgia is arguably, as a there's a problem with legitimacy. They were trying to legitimate their own situations by naming them, giving them a name, fibromyalgia. In several cases, they had to remind people of their invisible impairments because even though they had disclosed an illness um, earlier on, the person forgot because it's invisible. So they forget why somebody couldn't do something and they had to remind um, remind a coworker, or sometimes somebody at home as well. Uh, sharing also strengthened empathetic relationships. Sharing within a safe relationship uh, brought the two people closer, uh, and particularly when they shared impairments and they could talk about them and how they were dealing with them at work. But there were some negative consequences. One was being compared with others, as uh, we were talking about earlier, that if you say, I have fibromyalgia, uh, people then feel free to give you unwanted advice. One example was a woman who was quite annoyed um, at people telling her uh, that, well, my mother went on a vegan diet and that cured her of her fibromyalgia. You should do that too. And the woman said, I can't. I haven't got enough money. I can't afford health food. She was very annoyed by this. And other people talked about the same kinds of situations if they if they identified their illness. And they were um, also open to coworker resentment and gossip. Even in the case of a woman with rheumatoid arthritis, who two of the participants mentioned in their, on their team, who wore a brace. And even though she wore a brace, her impairment was visible, she still got gossiped about because her accommodation was working part-time. And people would say, well, why does she get to work part-time? even though she had a visible impairment. So it, it doesn't just happen to people with invisible impairments. So this was the second concept that I developed, portrayals of women with fibromyalgia by their workmates and their um, family members. And in making these um, portrayals, there were three aspects, not giving in to fibromyalgia, being a valuable employee, and being normal. And these, these uh, portrayals drew on three discourses. The idea of normalcy, which is a generally unquestioned idea that comes up in, for example, when uh, in return to work literature, when um, people who are contemplating return to work say, I really want to get back to work. For me, that's normal. That means I'm normal. 
And what does normal mean? <laughs> um, so that's an example of people using normalcy discourse. Another discourse was overcoming disability. This is the common idea. You often see it in media stories about um, somebody portrayed as a hero for having endured something terrible, climbing out of it, climbing up, meeting all the challenges through great personal strength and overcoming whatever challenge it is. It might be a disability, it might be an illness, it might be a major life event, but those stories in the media are quite common and people were drawing on those ideas in the way they portrayed women with fibromyalgia. The third discourse they were using was mind controls the body, that you can overcome disability using personal will and strength. They, these two are related. So in the, how these discourses played out in not giving in to fibromyalgia, the women and others talked about, um, for example, pushing through, pushing through pain and fatigue, which um, the women described as having a, co a, a consequence. If they pushed through pain and fatigue at work or some at home, they paid the price in pain later. Um, so this wasn't always a good strategy, but it was the way they got through things and one of the ways they stayed at work. And family members were quite concerned about this because they uh, were concerned that the women were damaging their health by doing this, but it was a strategy the women were using to stay at work. Being on disability was something that the women distanced themselves from. They didn't want to be labeled disabled. Um, they thought of people on disability as staying home and doing nothing, and they didn't want to be in that situation. So they spent quite a bit of time distinguishing themselves from somebody who's on disability. Similarly, they didn't think, they talk about themselves as being fibromyalgia patients, which is common in the fibromyalgia self-help literature, that you're a patient first. The women didn't seem to see themselves that way. They and their family members and workmates talked about strong will, having a positive attitude, and not complaining. This was a big, she's not a complainer. I'm not a complainer like my mother was when she had chronic pain, and so on. Um, the next idea was the valuable employee, which responded to the assumption that people with chronic illness are less productive than um, healthy people. Um, many of the participants, uh, particularly this, the, the um, family members and the workplace parties, talked about the women as very hard workers uh, and very good at their jobs, loving their jobs. In, in other words, ways of portraying them as valuable employees who have a right to be in the workforce. And third, they, uh, many of the women didn't ask for formal accommodations. They asked, um, they did things informally. They used benefits that were available to everybody, uh, like part-time work, working at home, um, coming in late and staying late, flexible hours, those kind of benefits that are often brought into workplaces for work-family balance, but uh, women found them useful as well to deal with their chronic illnesses. Uh, as well, there was an example of a woman who took three months vacation. She got three months vacation because she had a low paid job and she used it to get away from winter, which made her fibromyalgia a lot worse. So she was using a benefit that was available to all the employees to deal with her own chronic illness. So here's an, uh, um, two quotes of uh, family members and supervisors talking about and portraying the women in the ways that I've just explained. A family member said, if you have a very calm and, pa and passive, a very calm and passive demeanor, fibromyalgia will eat you alive. I don't think that type of personality can handle it very well because that type of personality gives in to things. There's the giving in idea, not giving in. I think if you have a strong personality and you are strong-willed, it does not have to rule your life. And similarly, a supervisor talked about how hardworking her employee was with fibromyalgia. She has a number of health problems and she works 150%. She's the kind of person you have to push to take care, to say take care of yourself. She's got such a strong work ethic. If anything, she worries me sometimes. And this gets across the idea that family members were working, that the women were, uh, were worrying that the women were working too hard. So I'd like to wind down by talking a bit about some of the implications of these findings. Um, I found that disclosure is more than a one-time declaration to seek accommodations. It, it uh, involves dealing with risks every day and having to make up ways of, of uh, 
partially disclosing, selectively disclosing, or not disclosing at all to explain your everyday situations. It also points, the data also point out the importance of workplace relationships to staying at work. It's not just work capacity that matters, it's, it's the relationships you have and the kind of work that you have and the people that you work with. In some cases it works well, in some cases it doesn't. Uh, and there's many grays in between. Uh, I also wanted to point out that the data we're showing that in accommodation seeking marks employees as different and this may push them in the sigma process. So that's why some of the participants were careful about seeking accommodations. Uh, so I think we need to rethink accommodations as a primary strategy for employees with chronic illnesses. And I, I, I'd love to hear more about your thoughts about this. Um, I know Monique is going to be um, presenting in a couple of weeks on your research having to do with accommodations and Mary's working on that subject so I'd love to uh, have a discussion about that and I also wanted to bring up that at the CRWDP National Symposium a couple of weeks ago Isaac Zetanyel who from McMaster uh, brought up an interesting statistic from the Canadian Disability Survey that 63 percent of respondents had not disclosed their disabilities at work and hadn't sought accommodations. So there's a large number of people, proportion of people who aren't following this route of disclosing a need for accommodations and getting them and um, that we may think of that as problematic or perhaps we need another way of helping people stay in the workforce. So there's my references which you can access uh, when the presentation goes up on the website. And my acknowledgments, thank you to the participants because of course without them there wouldn't be any study and for, to CRWDP for funding my doctoral work. And I want to close by telling you uh, where I'm going now. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm concerned about accommodations, um, whether people find them the most useful way to stay at work, whether in fact they are uh, the key go-to strategy for staying at work. Uh, for people with chronic illnesses in particular who have invisible impairments and maybe have a choice, it may not be a choice, but sometimes do have a choice of whether to disclose uh, their impairments and their need for accommodations. And one problem I see with accommodations is that they tweak work environments to fit the impairment of individual employees. They're individually, they're an individual solution, attempting an individual solution to a much more global problem, which is um, the accessibility of workplaces in general. Uh, accommodations fit people in rather than making systemic changes to expand the accessibility of workplaces. Uh, so I'm exploring the idea of uh, applying universal design principles to workplaces. Universal design is a concept that comes from several decades ago uh, in urban planning where uh, cities were redesigned to allow curb cuts, ramps, building codes were changed to require uh, braille buttons and things we see today that make physical environments a lot more accessible than they were 30 years ago um, have radically changed the mobility of people with sensory disabilities. So could the same principles be used somehow to make workplaces more accessible for people with chronic illnesses who have different needs? So I'm going to leave you with that and, uh, and I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.